Welcome to Discovering. I'm in the North Central UP with a group of hunters and their beagles. We're going hare hunting. Our fathers rabbit hunted together back in the day. Got us rabbit hunting. That's all we used to do in high school. It's good to see we got our kids involved in it somewhat. And Kristen was on Keweenaw Bay jigging for smelt. See, when I see you get two at a time. That's all tonight, so stick around. It's time for the UP's very own Discovery. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill, the eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. That's what deer hunting sounds like. That's the sound of grouse and woodcock hunting. And that is the unmistakable sound of rabbit or hare hunting. Each year in Michigan, more than 80,000 hunters hit the woods in pursuit of rabbits and hares. There you go. We got I connected up with a group of hunters in the north central UP for oh, a yeah. day of hare hunting. Bill's paralleling. He got squirt and scout. Here's what we're doing. We're out here we're chasing ducks. Okay, we've got a rabbit running. They lost it right now, they're checking it, and then they're gonna check it, they're gonna pick up on it. Hopefully they pick up another one, hopefully they run three by. Get all three, we'll see. Stay tuned for more. So these dogs came to a loss. They'll pick up on another one, but we gotta get to this opening over here. We jumped this rabbit when we walked in here. Come on, Blue. Roscoe, he's 14 years old. He go, he go, he go, Roscoe, he go, he go, he go, he go. He go. Well, Blue, well, we've been hare hunting for, I don't know, since he was two. He's 14 now. He's an old beagle. Bring him back out. We ain't never too old to get out in the woods. This is my buddy Dan here. We grew up rabbit hunting. Our fathers rabbit hunted together back in the day. Got us rabbit hunting. That's all we used to do in high school. Rabbit hunt, goose hunt, goose duck hunt, hunt yeah. deer hunt. It's good to see we got our kids involved in it somewhat. We got some guys that are going to go around the bowl. We got some guys posted up along this trail here. We're hoping to get a get a hare to come out. We got some guys here that's never hare hunted before, so new experience for them. Yeah, even squeaking of your snowshoes, man, they'll hear you. They're two different species, uh, for one thing. Uh, a hare turns white in the wintertime, where a cottontail stays brown all uh, all year long. And typically, we don't have very many cottontails this far north in the UP. Um, they don't have the running gear to 
to stay on top of the snow to survive. And uh, so the predators get them pretty easily. It's a lot different hunting. Cottontails, they sit a lot tighter. They don't run as far. You know, they typically, they'll, they'll hole up. If they can find a hole, they'll go in a hole. A hare will not go in a hole. I've seen them climb trees at the, down a deadfall, but they won't go in a hole. Um, they'll go in a circle just like a cottontail, but it's just a lot bigger circle. And uh, this time of year in March hare, uh, it's breeding time for them. So they get a, you get a buck, uh, a buck hare that came in from another cedar swamp a mile away and breeding some does. And if you jump him, the dogs will take you, take you for a ride all the way back to his home territory. And that could be a long, that could be a long run. A lot of guys, they don't hunt in the March. And the snow conditions can be a lot more challenging in March too, because they get a lot of ice. Like today, we got a lot of ice on the snow. It's really hard for the dogs to smell a rabbit. You gotta have a dog with a really good nose. The hare hunting, it's, it's a lot like deer hunting. They can see color, they can see movement. Uh, just taking your safety off, they'll turn, go the other way. They're not concerned about the dogs as much as they are you. They're really concerned about people. So you really got to be quiet. So if they get on a rabbit, they're going to make a short circle, hey, real short. If you turn the rabbit hard, a lot of times, you know, they're so a lot of times they're 100 yards in front of the dog. So a lot of times they'll run back on their tracks for 50 yards or you know 30 yards and then turn. And when the dogs come up to that, they just keep going and they don't know any better to uh, to turn on that track. It's called overshooting the overshooting the the track, and uh, it's sometimes that you know they they lose the rabbit that way. If the dog's not smart enough to go back and look for it. it takes a good dog around here. Stray? No, dog are running. How's that? Nice. What's this? So here, here's the attack plan. We got tall trees, thick over there. There's a nice little swale, this little bowl. We're gonna drop down, get on a rabbit, run it this way, and hopefully circles it back this way. So we're trying to get them on two different rabbits, get a double going. We'll see how things go. Let's stir it up. Gary ran through here. So the dogs are pushing on the line right now. And when they break down and they're not barking, they're scent checking. So they're trying to pick up where that rabbit went. So the dogs are running this way. Well, the rabbit goes this way. The dogs keep going this way. Now they're looking over here. Well, the rabbit went this way. So then they go, and then they pick up on it. And then they run a straight line towards it. Main thing is keeping that rabbit moving. So the snow conditions, we got small legged dogs sink down a little bit. They're getting worn down. They're running a little bit slow today, but at least they're keeping it moving. Same conditions, not optimal, but good. So we'll see, uh, see how many we get today. Get it? 
starting to turn color already. Brown in the summer. Look at those feet. As long as my fingers, some of them. This is a smaller rabbit. That helps them keep them on top of the snow. They never even touch it. Deer, turkey, grouse, and bear. Waterfall rabbits and snowshoe hare. All words that take on a whole new meaning when followed by the word hunting. The camaraderie, friendships, and memories. Reliving the old ones and making new ones. Each trip to the woods, honing our skills for the next trip to the woods. And it's of course being in the outdoors. Not at all a bad place to spend time with your family and friends. Yeah, hunting is the pursuit of game and all that stuff. And of course it's a tradition. But we don't hunt because it's a tradition. It's a tradition because we hunt. Our fathers rabbit hunted together back in the day. Got us rabbit hunting. It's good to see we got our kids involved in it somewhat. And as long as we continue to pass it on, it'll be what we do and never be something we used to do. There's a fish. Look at that, pull bender, pull bender. Ugh. Yeah, that's a nice one. You saw it right, we're fishing for smelt. Earlier this winter, I met up with a local fisherman at the head of the Keweenaw Bay between Launce and Barraga to see how he catches smelt through the ice. This is the main part of it. This is what attracts them. It's just an ATV bulb. I made it in high school. One of the only things that I really like paid attention to to learn about was things about fishing. You can't see it too, too well, but there's metal prongs on it. You just wire them to the two across and you're on high beam and just make sure you stick it in the water before you turn it on. They'll blow it if you plug it in all and turn it on because, it, because they get too hot too fast. But if you stick it in the water, not a problem. So you stick her in there about five, six feet and I usually set it under my battery like this so that I don't lose it. And there is no positive or negative on this. This is just a regular straight so you don't have to, and there it's on. And when it gets dark, this whole lake will glow right around this tent. And then he's got a light down and the other guy, so he kind of, it brings him right in and attracts him. You could step into my office and we'll be good to go. Of course, you got to go to your local bait store and get some, some wax worms. But I always, uh, I just kind of go plain Jane. I use a, just a regular Swedish pimple to glow in the dark. I think it's a number three. And then I always, my trick is I get the teardrop with the bigger hook. Because if you get the small hook, time you get the wax worm on there, you got no room to hook the fish. So that's always been my trick. And I think a lot of people think that, uh, you know, smelt, smelt with small mouths. Well, no, not true. They'll, they'll take a, a, like a number four or number five of one of them, no problem. So I've always seemed to have that work for me better. So that's how I usually, usually do it. I usually always hook them backwards. See, that's like the head part that holds on better. It seems like if you go string them that way and then just string one on, I just put one on the hook. A lot of guys fish two, three teardrops. I don't like that because you you go through more wax worms. You usually catch them at one at a time. Every now and again, you'll get a double, but all I usually use that for is to tell you what depth they're biting at. You know, like if they're on the top hook, you know, they're say, you know, up up a little higher or whatever. And because this is actually one of the first years I've ever used a graph. Usually I was just come out and go with depths. Well, I always wait till the top one gets the, the hole and I usually go about 20 feet, about seven poles like that or so is what I usually set them at, so. And then, you, of course, you can watch it and see how it is, but I usually go there and when they come in, you can uh, usually, usually 20, 25 feet. Most nights you average 40 to 50. Years ago, we, when I had more time and, you know, we stayed till 10, 30, 11 or whatever, we'd get, if, if they bit good, we'd get 200 sometimes. Well, me and, last Wednesday, me and a buddy, we had 150 right here, but they were one right after the other, bite, 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 so. <laughs> When they're on it pretty heavy, you'll be amazed. They almost bend the whole rod over. You wouldn't think that a fish that small is that that strong, but when they're hitting, it's uh, 
it's very interesting, very fun. You know, a lot of muser odd holders, a lot of guys can hold them steady too, but I, I found it just easier on a pail, it's flat and you know, you can see it and give it a little, give it a little twitch every now and again and try to tease them. And now they're starting to, starting to move in about 25 feet. You wouldn't think that there would be that many, actually that many fish down there for that long period of a time, but they just keep moving in, moving in, moving in. <laughs> two of them, double. See, when I say you get two at a time, you do get two at a time. That, well, when they're down there that thick, they, they go. So yeah, well, that's neat. Just wait all night for a bite and get a double. <laughs> Bonus. These are actually perfect size for tip-ups too. Real shiny too out of the lake compared to the river. They're real blue, you know, like a purplish blue color along there, you know. In the lake, like, or, or in the river, they're always gray. That's gotta be a big one. They don't even bend the rod. Oh, oh, oh I got the other line too. <laughs> hmm, lucky. Yep, awful tiny. Awful tiny if he is. He might be, but. Oh yeah, now oh, there's a lunker. State record there. French fry. That's it. That's it. Call them if you're eating them. Nice, nice little French fry. And like I said, if you're gonna if you're gonna eat them, this is what you eat them. Eat them on the on the lake here compared to you know, on the river. You know, because when you clean them, you're totally amazed. You're you're like, oh, it ain't all stuck to the you know the sink and the scissors and everything. And it it's like actually cleaning a regular fish. Everything comes out all nice and they're and they're more firmer. Actually, when you cook them, they curl up when you get them on the on the cold water like that. So. Really? There you go. We got a pole bender. That's a nice one. Eh? Monster. Good eater. <laughs> Actually, that size is, is the best for pike bait. A little bit bigger, you know, gives the pike a little something to eat. It seems like you get more bigger fish with the smelt you know like the minnows and that and the chiners it seemed like they they pull them off on you you know and oh the size of that one that's a, that's a nice one mm -hmm. on on the old teardrop mm -hmm. i got them on the upstream mm -hmm. <laughs> got them on the little pimple the old glow in the dark one don't really matter too much on the color but i usually I usually use uh, a lot of oranges and greens. When they're biting, they're they're not real picky. I got a buddy that fishes. He uses just a bare hook and a wax worm. So I mean, it it it's all depends on uh, what mood they're in, I guess. Oh, that's a nice one. That's more of a you know. Half a meal there. <laughs> you can almost flay him. Okay. That one? Yep. <laughs> they remind me of mini piranhas, is, is what I always uh, think of them as, because they got these little tiny fangs on them and they're very vicious. You can't even get the worm back from them a lot of times when you go to take them off. They want to keep it. <laughs> Here, I'll show you the fangs on these things. I'm amazed. Oh, look, you can't even get the line out of them. The, the teeth on these. On, on these things are like, for as small as they are, they're actually, they're huge. I mean, I can imagine if them were like four or five pounds or like little, mm. little tiny piranhas. <laughs> Big male, it's rough, rough scale. That's usually how, how you could tell they're males. Little female, got a big old belly on her. She's already, already to go spawning in the spring. So you know, you can see, oh, I missed them. I miss a lot. Yeah, it was always my joke back in the day. I'd come out here and at least I know I can't get skunked doing this, but last year I, uh, I had to sit here four and a half hours so I didn't get skunked. I caught one smelt, but I said there was no way I was ever gonna ever gonna have that on my record. I got skunk smelt fishing, so, so I toughed them out. Well, that's it for this week. Be sure to check out 906outdoors.com where you'll find the 906 fishing report, TV6 weather, shopping, and more. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.